So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers of the uh, meeting for allowing me to speak and give this data. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is the short-term safety profile of intravitreal zivaflibercept. And zivaflibercept goes by the trade name of Zaltrap. Um, as you well know, all of the anti-VEGF drugs that we administer, though with very different biochemical compositions, all work by the same mechanism. They all bind to diffusible VEGF, thereby preventing its binding to transmembrane receptors, dimerization of the receptors, and intracellular activation and downhill pathways. However, how we've gotten to that point actually differs quite a bit amongst the drugs. Genentech, in developing both ILEA and Lucentis, have both used murine antibodies, which they've then partially humanized, and in the case of Lucentis, actually cleaved into a fragment rather than a full segment antibody. Regeneron, in creating a flibercept, did a very different technique. They took pre-existing human receptor binding sequences from VGF receptor 1 and VGF receptor 2, and they then fused them onto the FC backbone of an antibody to create a pseudoantibody. Uh, and in doing so, they created the drug a flibercept. Well, in parallel to that, they created a drug that they've trade named Zaltrap. And Zaltrap is simply a flibercept that is packaged in formulator vials and used for intravenous therapy. And it's basically a direct competitor with Avastin used for the treatment of advanced colorectal cancer. So let's look at the three molecules themselves and see is there any reason to even consider using an off-label version of a flibercept. Well, we know that there are differences in sizes of the molecules and that basically it's a one to two to three ratio in terms of the sizes, with the flibercept being intermediate. And as a result, these molecules all have different half-lives inside the eye. So these are all pharmacokinetic and biochemical differences. Do they really make a difference to us on a treatment basis? By and large, not really. Binding affinities of the drugs, though, probably have a greater impact on what we see clinically. And if you look at the binding affinities in the center of the slide, these are expressed in picomolar, and the, and the interpretation of this is the smaller the number, the greater the binding affinity, or the stronger the molecule binds to VEGF dimers. And we see that a flibercept is approximately 100 times as strong as either ranibizumab or bevacizumab for the direct binding of a VEGF dimer. You would think that this would translate into an increased clinical effect. And originally, when the uh, VIEW-1 study came out, we thought it would have. The VIEW-2 study came out, and it seemed to, to contradict that. And the bottom line is, in most patients with AMD, there's not a big difference between the two drugs, other than perhaps a small difference in duration of action. We've subsequently come to learn that in the treatment of patients with severe DME, there may well be a difference. And a flibercept's binding affinity may give it a therapeutic advantage. Well, if different groups have l tried to look at, in an in vivo setting, or in the in vitro setting, the abilities of these drugs to inhibit endothelial cell migration and proliferation. I've shown two studies in the bottom of the slide. On the left, the ability of both ranibizumab and aflibercept were equal in terms of turning off endothelial cell migration and proliferation. In the study on the right, aflibercept was anywhere from 10 to 100 times as potent as both ranibizumab and bevacizumab at doing the same thing. How do we interpret these results? Well, the study on the left was produced by scientists at Genentech, and the study on the right was produced by scientists at Regeneron. <laughs> so, what is the drug availability and what's the problem? Well, ILEA is now available for AMD in over 80 countries, RVOs in over 60, DME in over 30 it is expensive. In the U.S., it's $1,950 per dose. And that, I'm sure my colleagues in this room will tell me it varies depending on whether you're in the European Union or where you are. In India, it's actually $500 per dose for ILEA. Well, Zaltrap's availability is a little bit more limited. The U.S., Great Britain, European Union, and Australia. Its cost is comparable to Bevacizumab, six to $700 for a four milliliter vial. The major difference between the two drugs is its osmolarity. ILEA is approximately 300 milliosmol per kilogram, roughly equivalent to our, our body's own osmolarity. 
uh, ILEA, is, or re Zeltrap rather, is, 300, is three times that, or 1,000 milliosmol per, per kilogram. And it's this increase in osmolarity that people are worried about that may cause ILEA, or Zeltrap rather, to have intraocular toxicity. So our hypothesis in performing this one-month pilot study was that intravitreal injections of zivoflibercept are one, safe, and two, effective in the treatment of treatment naive eyes with neovascular age-related macular degeneration. And as I had mentioned, the major barrier to intravitreal zivoflibercept use thus far concerns its safety profile. So our purpose was to evaluate the safety of zivoflibercept in the treatment of CNV secondary to neovascular age-related macular degeneration. There are a series of preclinical trials that suggest that zivoflibercept is safe intraocularly, particularly multiple trials uh, within rabbits. There are a couple of other studies that suggest that higher doses of this, particularly if given in vitro, may cause damage to uh, RPE cells or to and to mitochondria. In this study, we took eligible patients with CNV uh, and, each, and gave each of them a single intravitreal injection of zivoflibercept. We then did comprehensive eye exams at 1, 7, and 30 days, looking for any signs of toxicity, particularly intraocular inflammation or hemorrhages. We also did ERG testing both at baseline and at month 30 in each patient, or day 30 rather, in each patient. Now, primary outcome measures were safety parameters from both the clinical exam and the ERG testing. Our secondary outcome measures were changes in best corrected visual acuity and changes in central subfield thickness. Uh, here's where the multiple safety measures that we screen for at each visit. So the results were as follows. For the safety, none of the patients complained of blurred vision, pain, bulbar injection, any follow-up visits, nor was there any intraocular inflammation noted in any of the patients at any of the visits. Secondly, there were no significant changes in the implicit times, the A and B wave amplitudes, or the BTA ratios at one month on ERG testing when compared to baseline. None of the patients experienced serious ocular or systemic adverse events. The only exception was one eye developed what appeared to be some conjunctival necrosis at the injection site, but this resolved on topical therapy at five days later and had no subsequent sequelae. Uh, here were, here's a uh, synopsis of the clinical results, and if we put those together statistically, we found that the best corrected visual acuity on a logmar basis equated to about a 3.5 letter improvement in vision at one month, not unusual in a small pilot study in an, in an AMD population. The mean central subfield thickness improved from 321 to 265 microns, again, reasonably good at one month, and there were no changes uh, on OCT on the intravitreal retinal interface. A couple of sample cases, as you might expect for a drug that seems to have potency for the treatment of neovascular age-related macular degeneration. So in conclusion, Zibofleversept or Zaltrap appears to be safe through one month after single intravitreal injections for patients with neovascular AMD. The efficacy after single injections is a pr are in line with those in other pilot AMD studies. Certainly additional research is needed to establish long-term safety and determine its efficacy. We now have one-year data that we're compiling, and thus far the one-year data seems to suggest this drug is safe in the long term. And finally, a major question that we have to raise is, if Zifaflibercept is found to be A, safe, and B, effective, is it possible to use it on a medical legal basis and a practical basis in countries where ILEA have already been approved? Thank you. Oh, thank you. So we will be having a great conflict in the next few years, whether aflibercept or ziv aflibercept, same way like Venturi or Flo. <laughs> so we have one question, please. Just one yes, uh, important, uh, important findings and important discussion. Uh, Peter Gelbach from uh, Johns Hopkins, we've looked at this uh, very same question, and I have the good and misfortune to be on the pharmacy and therapeutics committee there. And uh, I can tell you that the osmolarity question was the first objection by the administration to uh, prevent, you know, the explosion of potential recompounding of drugs. <clears throat> Peter Campicero, myself, a number of other people said, the volume of injection is so small that the osmolarity question is almost 
uh, a very small question, and it, it's academic that, that we go through this exercise. I can predict for you from firsthand knowledge that the next objection is that we are essentially, at least in the U.S., recompounding an identical drug. And that's where they've drawn the, the battle line now. Yeah, and that's exactly where I would look for it to be. As Phil Rosenfeld has said repeatedly over the years, if he hadn't had a very understanding and competent pharma pharmacist in uh, Serafim Gonzalez, he never would have been able to get a flip, uh, Avastin compounded and used in his own pilot trials. This question then is that much more difficult because we already have the molecule available and FDA approved and quite frankly our only reason for doing this is now cost. And that's a real tough one to convince IRBs, ethics committees, pharmacists to overcome. Yeah, please. One last yes, question. Andre, the results that you showed with your monochromatic light therapy are very interesting and very similar to what we're seeing with um, Micropulse um, laser treatment. So this, this then explores the possibility that, that this, at least in the Micropulse laser treatment, we have much more of, um, basic studies to show what some of the therapeutic um, aspects are in terms of cytokine, healing cytokines, and uh, astrocytic reactions, and heat shock proteins that are really beneficial. And now what we've got to do is to look at combination treatments. Just, like, just as you've started now, we need to really explore this whole area. Then we will move to the protocol team. As you know, in real life situation, there is no one strategy that fit for all. And even we ourselves, sometimes we may move from tailored treatment to protocol treatment, or from one specific tailored treatment to another specific uh, treatment. So Dr. Befecto uh, will quickly discuss with, tell us, and I'd like you to actively participate. He will ask you some quick questions, and feel free to interact with the questions. Dr. Befecto, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Didier, for inviting me and making me travel halfway around the globe. So, my colleagues and friends, uh, just a brief uh, treatment review. And it goes straight to the general question, is that when we individualize our treatment protocol, are we not moving away too much from the protocol which is tested? And in behalf of the audience, we would like Somebody to comment? Anyone from the other team would like to answer the question? Uh, actually, it, uh, it's, uh, the, the response is under the question, actually, because uh, we individualize because we want to individualize uh, the treatment, because everybody is different. That's why we, uh, the, the studies gives us some clues, but they are not the real history. And they are just the means of many different cases. So we have to individualize and we have to be, um, we have to move away from the protocols just to individualize. So we have to do that, I think. So, I would comment and say that I think the question is very reasonable. What I object to in the question are the words too much. I think, yes, do we, do we move, when we move away, do we expect different results? We hope we don't get different results, but I think we have to be comfortable with accepting them. The question is, the problem is, protocolized treatments, they're really working very well and were critical for FDA approval are not really practical in terms of patient compliance and cost effectiveness. Yes. And so what we are striving to do, and I, I assume that virtually everybody in this room is doing the same thing, is trying to find something that A, works very well, and B, patients will tolerate in the long run. Thank you. Yes, please. Question for you, Abdallah, and for all the UK people present in this uh, room. As we understood, uh, in UK, the nurses are doing the IVTs, right? Do you think that in the whole Europe, even if the Brexit <laughs> is not in the, in the way you think, uh, we will be forced in within, a, let's say, two or three years, having the nurses to do that, and that this can modify the number of injections we are doing to the patient? 
Sorry, your question, uh, whether we are happy with the nurses to give the injection and... Do you, you think it will be inescapable that all the countries will have to give the injection to the nurses? Yes, because the burden is rapidly growing, not only for with MED, for diabetes, for BRVO, CRVO, yeah. and other non-tailored treatment. So definitely, the burden is rapidly and steadily growing. And uh, as you know, in the UK, the mentality is slightly different. So many hospitals, because of that, they do protocol treatment. Because arranging the appointment for the patient on regular intervals is quite difficult in terms of the booking and like that. So many hospitals do protocol treatment. Many hospitals now, the number of injectors, I mean nurses versus doctors, are 50-50 but it's expected to increase, I guess, in the future, because in one session, starting from nine o'clock till one o'clock, one doctor can inject around between 12 to 14 injections, and the number is rapidly growing. Even many hospitals now work on Saturdays, like an extra clinic sessions, to just to help to cover the growing demand for the injection. So definitely doctors enough can do that. We still need the nurses and they expect it to be like 80%, 20% in the near future. And do you think that when, the, when the, the doctor will not get the money for injection, perhaps the number of injection will decrease? We are not paid, so we are not paid for any injection. So you do the treatment session from nine to one, whether you give an injection to five or okay. 12 or 14, there's no extra payment, <laughs> even for the nurses. <laughs> Barbara is, yeah. Talk, do I have time? Yes. yes. Talking yes. about Quick protocols question. and ways to do. Uh, it's not only individualized on the need of the patient, but also and um, the reality of the country and the way of doing the, and the legal aspects. I'm going back to Italy, and in Italy we have specific guidelines on how to do the um, controls. And um, for instance, I have understood that we are one of the few countries that still use antibiotics pre-op and post-op. I have learned that uh, it's considered a mistake, but uh, our guidelines prevent us to avoid them. And if we don't do that, and if we have an endophthalmitis, we are legally pursuable. And also, do you always control your patient one day within 72 hours? Because that means that we have to see again the patient within 72 hours just to check that everything is okay. Are you obliged to do that as well, or is it just an Italian thing? No, you just, <laughs> you just give the injection. Every patient uh, at the way home, he got a leaflet. Whether if you feel something, if you feel yeah, that, please reasonable. make an arrangement and call form. and see in right. the emergency I just clinic. received an email from the Italian Society of Ophthalmology saying, we have heard that some colleagues are not checking the patient within 72 hours. Please review your way of doing because you are legally pursuable. So, uh, you know, it, that was to say that we are even forced by the country, regulation, by administration. I mean, well, I cannot do more than 100, sorry, 80 injection per month because it costs too high. Okay. 80, 80 is nothing. So if I want to um, guarantee to the same patient to follow a certain number of injections per year, I cannot uh, receive any new patient after a while because. Uh, yeah. okay. So unfortunately, we have to face ourselves with uh, daily mm, problems that are sent from administration and bureaucracy. Can I? Thank you. Yes, please, a quick uh, comment. Uh, Barbara, you're right. Uh, we face the same problem of anti antibiotic use, but we use only after the injection just to protect ourselves, not to protect the patient, but <laughs> from the medical legal issues. I mean, uh, the post-injection post anti antibiotics f to protect there are, ourselves. There are, you know, the Europeans and also US, US guidelines, I don't know if you can confirm that, that they say it's a mistake. 
it's not something that you can or cannot do. It's a mistake because we are just inducing uh, resistance. But so we should <laughs> spread the word much better so, to so actually, every country. And one of the speakers here, Abdish Bafsar, who was here yesterday, he, yeah. he probably has been one of the leaders in terms of right. not using intravitreal or topical antibiotics afterwards. And one of the findings of DRCRNet Protocol I was that in eyes that had prophylactic post-operative antibiotics had a higher end off the mitis rate than those that did yeah. not. So we have to find a way to institutionalize those guidelines and go back to the ministry and say, well, if I have an end of the mitis, it's not because I haven't used That's, that's your challenge, right? Yeah. Okay. To see you. the patient post-injection post uh, during the first uh, 72 hours is, again, uh, you know, it increases the number of visits a lot. And if you are doing the bilateral injections, I do myself bilateral injections simultaneously, but if you are doing the injections in different times, and if you see patients uh, the, the, within three days again, then the patient cannot go out of the hospital, and you have to deal with the same patient again and again. So we have to deal with that. Yeah, so we'll move next. The last one. I don't yeah. see it. Uh, there is another general question. What do you do with a completely dry macula after the first three loading injections? From the audience, perhaps? What do you do after the... Yeah. So normally, you first give the three loading doses. What do you do if you found the macula is totally dry? Do you follow a protocol? Do you follow an individual treatment? Why not give options? Sorry? Why not give options, or do you want us to comment? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm still a, a proponent of treat and extend. Um, I, I think that at least over the course of the first two years, the summation towards vision loss is the amount of time that patients had with active disease. And so the fewer times they have active disease, I think the better. Monthly therapy would be the best treatment, but once again, to try to find a balance. With treat and extend, theoretically at least, you only have one activation. And so that's what I would do after the first three. I prefer to uh, follow the patient for, for the first year, if, if it is just the first uh, three injections. I prefer to follow the case uh, without injecting monthly first, then if I see uh, an activation, I put the injection. And you start three loading those again yes. from the beginning. Yeah. Me too, I prefer to follow a uh, patient without injections during without one injection. year. Yeah. Anybody after three injections and found the macula dry, just observe the patient without any further injection? Okay, can you please raise your hand? If you... Oh, good. Yes, continue. I continue. Did you have any experience after treating several sessions with any intravitreal drug, the vision may deteriorate? What are the possible explanations? from the audience and the panel. Anyone from the audience would like to? Again, there's very little relationship between subretinal thickness and uh, visual acuity or any vision, how you measure it. What we have to do is look much more carefully at the progressive OCT findings that suggest that there are progressive degenerative changes from the leakage component and the lipoproteins which are toxic to the photoreceptors or from the dry components which lead to progressive atrophy. So I think these are things that are going to come out in the next few years in terms of a much more complex analysis of the OCT reactions and a much more complex view of our treatment sessions. Yeah, last comment please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Um, if, we are, if we have a patient like this, uh, we have two options. Maybe because of the atrophy, which is where the lesion is totally inactive, but because of the atrophy, the vision is deteriorating, or the uh, lesion is still active. If the lesion is still active, that means that your diagnosis may be, may, may be wrong. You may, have, uh, you may need PDT or something else, uh, like PCV. Uh, so you have to check out that for diagnosis. And um, another thing is if, if you, are ha you are having hemorrhagic response after intravitreal anti-VEGAS, anti then you should deal with that hemorrhage. Yeah. 
maybe surgically instead of doing more injections. Oh, thank you. So thank you, everybody. We hope that this session uh, would have been interesting for you. Thank you very much for your attendance.